<clears throat> All right, everyone, uh, Dr. Phil, biology, or microbiology, BI 230. I can't find the video, uh, my other Zoom video from my YouTube channel. So I'm gonna just redo the PowerPoint quickly. I wanna kind of go over the course a little bit while we have a minute. So uh, while I have my screen shared, I'm gonna pop into the course. Um, All right, so my end may look a little different than yours, but hopefully, uh, let's see here. So, all right, so I'm BI 235B 21 Summer One. Uh, we're doing this asynchronistically, uh, but uh, uh, if anybody wants to have office hours or questions, I can go on and do office hours and we can WebEx that. And then we can either uh, record it or not record it contingent upon what you want. But I kind of wanted to go in here and just show you the tabs here. This is my instructor. Just if you guys want to go into McGraw-Hill Connect Library, you can go in there. Um, I think it's 76 or 80, I'm not sure. Uh, you can get the book the e version of the book and you can do the interactive uh connect which is actually really really good a lot of good practice for you some videos if you want they have a free trial of two weeks if you want to try that out too uh, see if you like it and then buy it in here i also have chemistry worksheets all right so the deal with these are i'm not going over chapter two because it's chemistry you should have had that before uh in high school and um in your human bio or your A&P, you should have had it. Um, so there's worksheets in there if you want to go through and fill them out and scan them to me. Uh, I will give you two extra points for the course. And literally the answers are on the bottom of the sheet so you can't really get it wrong. Uh, just good review for you if you wanna do that, but that's, continue, that's up to you. So that's gonna be take place of chapter two. All right. Uh, the syllabus is <clears throat> in here. Um, it should open for you relatively easily. All right, so read through that. Uh, your tests will be randomly generated, um, which means that there will be several versions of the same question for you to go over. Um, so everyone won't get the same exam. So it'll be randomly generated uh, in chunks, different. Um, components of the different chapters. So they'll all be basically the same and just for the same question asked a few times. Um, I feel like I did this video already, but maybe I'm losing my mind. Um, there's no extra credit. I will not curve grades and I do not inflate grades. So as long as we're clear on that. Um, you guys have uh, five exams. All right, so uh, I will drop one of them. So you'll be graded on the four highest grades. That way, if something happens, um, we have uh, a little bit of a buffer. And I'm pretty sure with the course, I extended it out uh, until the third. So if you need a couple extra days, it really closes on the first. Um, you'll have a few extra days to do the course if you need it. If not, you can certainly do uh, it all ahead of time. Um, and each test will be uh, covering each unit, there's five units, five tests. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure I did this video before. Maybe I did it in WebEx. I'm missing my mind. <clears throat> so here's uh, optional course material, open educational resources for you if you want. Um, just pop that open for a second. So um, there's a free textbook. If you don't have a textbook with you, you don't want to buy one, um, wouldn't recommend that. But um, they're here, or if you don't have a textbook, if you want to pop into this and look up something and you want to print a page or two, um, not a big deal. There's some extra stuff, um, microbial. This is from Easy Microbiology, a lot of the basic stuff. Um, that they'll be asking you, they're all generic uh, microbiology dogma that they'll be asking you in your very near future. Um, and there's the units one, two, three, four, five. 
microbiology coloring book, and I'm pretty thousand percent sure that it's copied it upside down, and I don't know how to fix that, so I may have to scan the whole book again, um, <clears throat> which wouldn't make me very happy. All right, I have some of these videos I was able to find on genetics and uh, antimicrobials and um, stuff like that, so I'll be popping those into the course um, as we go along. Uh, what else do you want? Um, I think that's it. There's online tutoring if you want. You can pop into here. Well, I'm going to have to open that up for you guys. Yeah, I'll open that up for you. Um, oh, brain fuse. That's it. <clears throat> so it'd be brain fuse. You can go in here. It's um, it's free. All right. So if you have a uh, question in the middle of the night, um, there's people that SUNY has hired to uh, be tuners for you if you want to do that. And I've completely lost my spot here. Fantastic. No idea how to get back there. All right. Perfect. So, <clears throat> all right. So I guess I'm going to try to find the PowerPoint. I'll go over that um, quickly if I can. How do I get this thing out of the way? All There's got to be an easier way to do this. Good Lord. <clears throat> All right, so this is kind of just a brief. Let me get my ugly mug out of here. Um, just an overview of the course real quick. And then um, in the interim, go over the chemistry portion. Um, if you guys wanna go into Tolaro and connect and do that, it'd be great um, just to review chemistry. We're not gonna delve too much into that. It's just that when we talk about DNA and the um, hydrogen bonds and some of the bonding of different organisms, it's kind of nice to know. Um, don't really need to know it that much for this course, but in the future, if you need to take biochem, um, don't recommend that unless you get a good teacher. Um, I think it was my only C in my entire life. And I ran as fast as I could. Um, my teacher was horrible. I had to go to the library and learn it all myself. We didn't have, I think AOL was just starting. We didn't have any of the stuff that you guys have. So it was completely brutal. I think I read like three biochem textbooks on to kill myself when I got through it. Anyway. So microbiology, the study of organisms too small to be seen without magnification. We'll be seeing some of the uh, helminthes, the worms. And, um, you know, if you come to lab, we, you know, we may look at some of the fleas or ticks. Those are huge. You can see those. Um, hopefully this summer you won't see any ticks up close, but apparently um, due to the winter, mild winter, uh, they're going to be really prevalent. So please make sure that you are checking yourself or honestly, have somebody check your back or whatever. Last year I had my, something was in my shoulder blade. It was really bothering me. I had somebody look and they literally pulled a tick out of my scapula. So please check that. Um, and you know, not the bullseye ring for Lyme's disease is not uh, prevalent in all cases, you know, 50, 60, maybe 70%, all right? Uh, you may have a, a tick and not even know it. So please make sure you're checking especially if you're out hiking or walking or in the grass, uh, please check your pets and whether you pro spot your pets or not, please make sure they're wearing 
some kind of a collar. I don't really believe in any of the chemical or pesticides, but um, you know, if we're talking about our pets, we don't, number one, we don't want them to get infected. And number two, we don't want us to get infected either. All right, and we'll go over that when we talk about the rickettsia, we'll talk about that later. Um, once again, the course, uh, if you missed the earlier video, is going to be extremely uh, content intensive and it's gonna go by very quickly. Uh, like I said, it ends July 1st. I'll be doing hopefully three videos a week, whatever I haven't done or was able to capture from when I did the course uh, last, I think I did it uh, last spring. Uh, yeah, we had to just all of a sudden stop halfway through and do online. And I did it over the last year, I think. I'm losing, I lost my mind. I did it again uh, online, but I can't really retrieve my my videos, I'm sure some of them are on WebEx, um, but I really wanna do Zoom. I want to pop this into my YouTube channel and then I can send them over um, with the, they should be converting it uh, with the words too. So anyway, so we're looking at bacteria, viruses are super small. We're not gonna be able to see those with our microscopes here. Uh, fungus are huge, protozoa are very large, helminthes are large and uh, algae are large. So. What we're going to be doing in lab or um, concentrating the majority of the time on is bacteria. Spend a very little time on viruses, a little bit on fungus, protozoa, and worms towards the end. Algae, I'm not really concerned about. I'm not even going to cover it because it's really not going to be uh, clinically relevant. It's not really going to be a pathogen for most of us. So I really want to condense this to clinically relative microbiology for uh, healthcare workers, basically. All right, <clears throat> so you can look at these uh, through the book if you want, but just really, uh, I mean, spending a lot of time on immunology, a lot of courses uh, tend to skip that. I think it's extremely important to know how the immune system works. And the immune system I learned in 1998, <clears throat> pre and uh, taking my pre -recs is different than what I learned in grad school and it's completely different than what we know now. So I'll give you uh, what we currently know, but um, we don't even really know how it all works uh, 100%. Um, not even our buddy Fauci knows, I don't think, what's going on, but that's just my personal opinion. So public health, microbiology, and um, epidemiology. So if you want a job in that, um, trace, uh, infectious, whatever. Um, and then genetic engineering and recombinant DNA is huge coming up. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on genetic modification uh, of either organisms or food. Um, my um, try to keep my personal opinion out of it, but I really don't want to consume any genetically modified organisms. Um, unless I know that they are, and then it's my choice to consume them, all right? So origins of microbiology or microorganisms. All right, so if we look here, we can see that the planet's been around here for 15 billion years, okay? So we think we've been here a very long, long time, but we were the last species on the planet. So the analogy I heard was if we were looking at a clock, when we started at midnight and went all the way around, we literally showed up at 11.55 p.m. That's how late we were to the show. All right, and then we'll see coming up how um, <clears throat> eukaryotes, we can assume they um, develop from a prokaryote um, cell engulfing another prokaryote. And then that prokaryote that was engulfed um, turned into a nuke or, or um, mitochondria for energy production. And we kind of know that because the ribosome of a prokaryote uh, is the same ribosome as we have in our mitochondria. But every other part of our cells is a different ribosome size. Just our mitochondria is the same as a prokaryote. So we can assume that um, that was the origin of it. And when we start talking about antimicrobials, all bacteria have 
ribosomes, and we can go in and we can, we can effectively um, eliminate a lot of them, destroying the ribosome, they won't be able to produce um, proteins or enzymes, or uh, we can make defective proteins. But please realize it'll start affecting our mitochondria because we have the same uh, ribosomes in the mitochondria as the prokaryotes, right? So bacteria-like organisms existed on Earth for about 3.5 billion years, right? Uh, prokaryotes are pre-nucleus. These are very simple cells. Eukaryote, you meaning true nucleus, are complex cells. And they'll be asking you, I will be asking you, I guarantee you, and other people will be asking you the difference between a prokaryote and eukaryote. Well, one is nucleated, one isn't. There's a difference with um, the DNA, its location, uh, size is different. So those are three things that they'll be asking you, some variation of that in the future. All right, so prokaryotes are microscopic unicellular, meaning one organisms. These lack nuclei and they lack membrane bound organelles. So if you're in lab and they ask you, if you're looking at bacteria, did you see any membrane bound organelles? And if you say, yes, I did, well, um, whatever you saw on the slide was not a membrane bound organelle. All right, an organelle means little organ and only eukaryotes have these um, organelles, and we'll be talking about the nucleus, the Golgi apparatus, ribosomes, smooth, uh, rough ER, um, vesicles, um, all the different organelles of a cell. And I will expect you to know uh, what each organelle, what its main function is, right? And we'll be going over that. And I popped a video into Blackboard if you want to watch that. It's actually uh, very good. It'll give you an idea of what each part of the cell does. Right. And then viruses are acellular parasitic particles composed of nucleic acid and protein. All right. So if we had 100 scientists in a room, 50 would say this thing is alive, 50 would say it's dead. Um, you know, viruses, everyone says, oh, you know, we want to kill these viruses. Well, technically, most people would say they're already dead. All right. And if we're talking about the coronavirus, it's capsulated, extremely easy to kill. All right. Sunlight will kill it. Um, most everything will kill it. Uh, Lysol will kill it. Um, and I'll mention it again. Lysol, it says it kills 99.9% .9 of germs or whatever. The 0.1% are the spore former uh, bacilli and clostridium strains. And we'll be talking about that coming up too. All right. So there's your prokaryotic cell, all right? It's got a cell wall, cell membrane, all right? Ribosomes, chromosomes. <clears throat> so that's, that could just be a bacteria or something small. It has flagella, all right? A lot of the bacteria have that's for motility. Human cells don't. The only one that uh, is relative here is this uh, sperm cell has flagella. But these, this is a eukaryotic cell. This should be familiar from high school biology, all right? True nucleus has a nucleus with the DNA, mitochondria for energy production. And once again, the ribosome size in the mitochondria of a eukaryote is the same as a ribosome in a prokaryote. All right, so try to keep that in mind. All right, cell membrane here, biphospholipid layer, that should be familiar. And then viruses are extremely small. And there's a bacterial virus or bacterial phage some of these are envelope, some of them are um, capsids, and these literally, most viruses can get into a cell, but only, only very specific cells. I can't just randomly jump into any cell. They have to be able to uh, attach the cell, and the cell has to be able to let it in. It has to recognize it as, well, not... <sighs> I don't want to say recognizes not foreign, but it has to have the receptor. It has to have a lock and key mechanism to get inside the cell. Like if we're talking about um, hepatitis that really only can enter liver cells, we're talking about um, HIV, it says AIDS virus here, that can really only attach to CD4 cells or a lot of the uh, antigen presenting cells it can attach to and get in. And that's how AIDS works. It attaches to the CD4 cell, hides in there or destroys it. And the CD4 cells, we will learn coming up, 
really triage your immune system. They actually activate your um, <clears throat> B cells, plasma cells for antibody production, and they activate your T cells, your specific um, immune cells, and the T cells will actually go in and have literally hand-to-hand -hand combat with these cells and destroy them. Um, the B cells, they produce antibodies and the antibodies are in the blood. They don't actually fight with the cells, but they'll attach the cell, they'll jam up the receptors, um, they'll opsonize it, they'll super tag it. And we'll talk about that. We're talking about immunity, All right? So there's um, microbacterium tuberculosis. We'll learn about this. Um, reproduces and divides very, very slowly. So drug treatment for that can take six, eight, 12 months to do. It has a mycolic waxy layer on it. So even our macrophages in our lungs, when we breathe that in, have trouble um, <clears throat> killing them. They can't even get to them. Um, and if we can't kill them, the body kind of sort of uh, surrounds it and um, sequesters it, I guess is the best word, but we'll talk about that too. Fungus, all right, so remember mold in the cold, yeast in the beast. So these are dimorphic, they change shapes depending on their environment. And if you had a fungal infection, it doesn't really want to go deep into your tissues because it's just too warm. It doesn't find that very um, hospitable for them. LGI said, we're not gonna really talk about that. Not gonna be pathogenic um, to any extent. Sorry, that's the light zero on motion. Okay. And viruses are going to be super small. We'll spend a little time on that. Protozoa, these are huge. All right, you'll be able to see these in a slide. And then helminthes. We'll talk about roundworm. We'll talk about some tapeworm, but these are actually um, inside of muscle tissue. All right. Cool or gross, depending on how you want to see it. And then we really want to look here at just the range of sizes of things. All right. Hydrogen and helium are the two smallest elements. They make up about literally 70% of the, uh, <clears throat> the space, the, the blank space in space, I guess, if that makes any sense. All right. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about range of, this is the electron microscope. What you'd need to see these, these are how small these things are. Um, AIDS, poliovirus, hepatitis virus, uh, flagellum, you really can't see. We're gonna try to do that in lab. We're gonna put flagellar stain on, kind of like putting mascara on. You can see if we can see them by just enlarging them. Um, obviously we can't see DNA in a regular microscope. So this is kind of what we're looking with the light microscope. See, relatively um, large, I guess. Um, the best we can do here is 10 times 100 is 1,000 with oil immersion, magnification of 1,000 times. Some microscopes have a 20x ocular on them, so 20 times 100 would be 200 or 2,000. So um, we don't have any of those here. We just have um, 10x oculars and um, 100x oil immersion lenses. All right, so that's the best we can do here. All right, so just kind of get a relative idea of the size of these things. All right. We'll talk a little bit about um, photosynthesis. Uh, in the course, I'll, I'll let a little bit uh, light fueled conversion of carbon dioxide to organic matter. And please realize that really the sun is a source of all energy. So photosynthesis makes the plants, the mammals eat the, the plants, and they produce energy for us. All right, and we'll see coming up when we do the, um, the Krebs cycle thing, we'll, we'll, we can run that equation forward and backwards, the same equation, all right? Producing ATP, C6, uh, H12O6, and some oxygen, we can produce ATP and CO2, um, a little carbonic acid, but we can run it back and forth, the same equation. Decomposition, we'll talk about bioremediation, uh, pseudomonas and some of these other microorganisms, breakdown of dead matter into waste and simple compounds. And please realize we need this. We need bioremediators to break down organic matter um, on the planet. All right. Biotech, production of food, drugs, and vaccines using living organisms. So we can harness um, 
this and we can uh, make uh, semi-synthetic uh, penicillins and semi-synthetic antimicrobials using this, all right? And we initially, we, use, we can use it to make, um, like I said, penicillin. We used to use them to make um, acetone and different, different things. So we've been harnessed that. And we're gonna find that, you know, a lot of these clot busters were from streptokinase. These, these um, enzymes that bacteria put in to break down blood clots uh, in the body. Well, we can harness that to use it in um, biomed. Genetic engineering manipulation, of the genes of org organisms to make new products. All right, so that's a huge new field, but actually it's been around since the seventies, but they're really um, making a lot of um, advancements in that. In bioremediation, using living organisms to remediate an emotion, uh, an environmental problem that we really need. We need something, you know, we're finding the bacteria that can break down all this plastic, all the um, plastic and water bottles that everyone thinks get recycled. You know, a lot of times <clears throat> they're shipped um, to India and other countries where they just bury them. Um, you know, there's a YouTube video, maybe I'll post it. It's called The Truth About Bottled Water. And we'll find that uh, it's all, according to this video, it's all a big scam. And a lot of this is just filtered tap water um, I have reverse osmosis in my kitchen and, <clears throat> you know, basic, uh, whole house filter, right of filtering it a zero filter, <laughs> whatever. All right. <clears throat> so lifestyles of microorganisms, majority live in a and free existence are relatively harmless and often beneficial. All right. So a lot of people think, oh, bacteria are dirty. They're disgusting. They're going to kill us. Most bacteria don't care about you whatsoever. There's only about 20 or 25 different uh, bacteria that are going to be even pathogenic. Some of them are true pathogens, which means even if you're super healthy, they can cause disease. A lot of them are um, opportunistic. So if you have a um, diminished immune system or you're, um, you're weakened or whatever, some of these organisms can set up disease. And most of these organisms, if they are where they belong, it's never a problem. It's when Organisms that might be in your microbiome and your digestive tract get into your um, lungs or get into your blood where they don't really belong, then they start causing problems. So majority of these um, are free existence. A lot of these are in soil, like Pseudomonas, and a lot of these bioremediators, Clostridium, uh, Perfringes, and, and all these other organisms. They're in the soil all over, and they, you know, some of these are nitrogen fixators, and we need them in the soil. Um, to grow crops and a lot of, you know, we're not talking about nutrition in this course, but a lot of these pesticides and, and other things that they're spraying in those food is just killing all the microbiomes in the soil. So even our, our soil is not even nutrient rich and our food right now, believe it or not, has literally one sixth to one tenth the nutritional value it had um, from when my grandfather had a farm in Oswego. Right? Uh, in case you guys don't know, or if I don't mention it, I grew up on an organic farm in the mid to late 70s up to 81. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we had no pesticides, no herbicides. Our, um, you know, we, I remember having ladybugs delivered and earthworms and praying mantises and all kinds of crazy. I thought my parents were absolutely insane. All right, but, um, you know, I don't know. That's how I grew up. So some microorganisms have close association with other organisms. So we'll talk a little about parasites that live on or in the body of another organism. And some of these are trans, they, you know, like a, a flea or, you know, even possibly a tick, they're transient. So they're gonna just be parasitic for a little while and they're gonna drop off or, um, you know, lice, um, we can talk about bubonic plague, you know, with these uh, Yersinia pestis with um, these flea bites and things like that. They're just going to be transient. Other parasites are going to live there. They could be um, roundworms or some of these um, tapeworms are eh, more or less transient. Some of them can live in your body for a long, long time until either they die or you die. Right. And a lot of these are going to cause uh, damage to the host. 
right? That's just another one. So pathogens are microbes that do harm. Nearly 2,000 different microbes cause diseases. All right, this is gonna usually be in other um, third world countries or, or where um, the population is reinfecting themselves with um, dirty water or they don't have um, the methods we have or you know, sanitation might not be um, as prevalent. They're you know, not burying their, their waste. So they're just giving each other cholera and all kinds of you know, whatever's living in their digestive tract. They're excreting it and then recontaminating themselves. Just so 10 billion new infections uh, a year worldwide. And just realize in some third world countries, some of these um, people, they have um, opportunistic um, parasites and things living in their body. And that's normal. I mean, everyone does that over there, all right? So 12 million deaths from infection a year worldwide. But if you look at this respiratory infections, so common in this country, maybe pneumonia, influenza, uh, AIDS hopefully is on the downfall. Um, it's more prevalent. Unless it's statistics change in Sub-Sahara Africa, um, diarrheal diseases, cholera, dysentery, typhoid. You know, hopefully we don't have in this country because we have um, better sanitation than other countries. TB. All right, that's you know I don't want to start a political discussion here, but we need to start worrying about. Um, tuberculosis coming over um, our borders, we're not testing for it because these, some of these, um, and this TB that's coming over is uh, microbial resistance. So we're gonna have a major, major problem. Malaria, that's bloodborne. So if somebody's coming over with malaria, I, I doubt, you know, unless you're coming from a, a country that's prevalent with malaria and it can be transmitted from one person to the other. So, you know, you guys can have your own political opinion about whatever, um, I don't have any problem with people coming into the country legally as long as they're tested. Um, but we, something <clears throat> we probably have to start um, thinking about. Uh, it's 2021 right now, end of May. Um, <clears throat> but if I'm teaching this course in another three years or whatever, um, <clears throat> I'll pull this video out and say, I told you so. So here is. Um, <clears throat> top causes of disease worldwide. This is the US and this is worldwide, all right? So just look at the difference there, all right? Cancer and stroke, other countries, stroke, cancer is a little bit lower, but there's the prevalence of different countries and what they have, depending on what they eat, uh, what they're exposed to, their water conditions, their health care. You know, we have supposedly the best health care in the world, but we have the sickest population. So I don't know what that tells you about our stress or our eating habits or our, our health in general. So I'll pop some videos in there about the historical foundations of microbiology. They love to ask those questions, you know, about Jenner and Lister and um, aseptic technique and just realize people didn't used to wash, they didn't wash their hands usually they'd be you know back in the day they'd be um you know medical schools or whatever they'd be doing cadaver dissection and then somebody would um be delivering and they would you know wipe their hands off and then deliver the baby they didn't even know about germs they thought that you know germs just uh, spontaneous, spontaneously generated and we'll see lister and pasteur and some of these other um people coming up here. So prominent discoveries include microscope, obviously Lewis, uh, he was a, a Dutch merchant. He was looking at um, the most primitive microscope. He was looking at the, the weave of fabric. And then he started um, scraping the plaque off his teeth and pulling things out of his wig. I, mean, I don't wanna think about it. And looking at them. Um, Used to call them molecules or what do you call them? Uh, it'll, it'll be up here. <clears throat> All right, we'll talk a little bit about the scientific method. I will be giving you a question or two on that. That should be review for everyone, hypothesis and being able to replicate um, Cox postules, talk about being able to replicate that um, scientific experiment. Development of medical microbiology. 
and then microbiology techniques. We'll be doing a lot of that in lecture, and we're doing a lot more of that in lab. So spontaneous generation is an early belief that some forms of life could arise from vital forces present in non-living or decomposing matter. So they thought that flies um, just came out of manure. They didn't realize that you know flies were laying eggs and things like that. And then we'll see, you know, we're gonna have these goose neck bottles <clears throat> where air can't get to it. These organisms wouldn't grow in the in the rotted meat. Louis Pasteur eventually just proved spontaneous generation and proved that theory of biogenesis, the idea that living things can only arise from other living things. And that was heresy back in the day. Oh, Leuvenweck. Anthony von Leuvenweck, all right. Dutch linen merchant, first to observe living microbes, single lens microscope uh, up to 300 X. And um, yeah, he there was stuff just crawling around his wig, nasty. There's his first microscope, pretty awesome. All right, so scientific method, approach taken by scientists to explain a certain natural phenomenon. So you should know what a hypothesis is. So you're looking at something and you kind of think, well, why would that be? Or you have an idea, you have to be able to prove that. Uh, you know, and it, it's a theory until you can prove it. Once you can prove it and it can be replicated, then it becomes a law or a principle. All right, discovery of spores and sterilization. John Tyndall and Ferdinand Kahn um, each demonstrated the presence of heat resistant forms of some microbes. Kahn determined that these. Uh, forms to be heat resistant bacteria called endospores. So endospores literally, you have to increase the temperature to 121 degrees for about 15 minutes. So we have an autoclave, sort of like your um, uh, <clears throat> pressure cooker or um, easy pot or what are those? Instapot, yeah, your Instapot's the same thing. So by increasing the pressure in this, um, one atmospheric pressure can raise the temperature by 15 degrees. So two atmospheric pressures, I think I got this right, is 30 degrees. So everything here on campus, um, I autoclave 40 minutes, uh, 131 degrees. So there's no way that endospores or anything is living when it leaves the autoclave. And we'll talk a little bit later about tendalization. So if we don't have an autoclave, um, we'll talk about heating things, killing vegetative bacteria, and then letting the endospores revegetate, killing them again and again and again. It's a, it's a two to three day process um, to kill all endospores. And once again, I said endospores, you really can't kill them with um, <clears throat> bleach or hot water or detergents. The only thing that can theoretically kill it would be hydrogen peroxide in enough concentration with enough exposure time um, to do it. Right. Other than that, it's they can't kill them unless you autoclave them. Sterility requires the elimination of all life forms, including endospores and viruses. So anything that leaves the autoclave is sterile. That means there's absolutely nothing living on it. So when you go to the dentist or whatever and they pull out those dental instruments, dental instruments, we want to make sure that those things were autoclave. We want to make sure that you're not putting anything in, I'm not putting anything in your mouth that could potentially have spores or bacteria on it. <clears throat> All right, so we'll, they'll talk about using scientific method to investigate bacterial endospores. So you guys can read up on that and we'll, we'll revisit that too. All right, I'm just saying that um, the hypothesis was this should be able to kill it, but they found out that no, it can't. And they found uh, endospores or bacteria or things that were um, in the, in the pyramids and they found things that were in, in uh, uh, plane wrecks from, you know, hundreds of years, a hundred years, not hundred, couldn't be, because the planes went around. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, mummies and, and things, uh, archeological digs, and they were able to bring these things back to life after 10,000 years, absolutely phenomenal. So we'll be doing aseptic technique in lab. So we're going to make sure that we don't, um, everything's sterile and we transfer things from a broth to a, a tube or a tube to a broth. And then we're going to street plate it and see if we should only have that organism in there. If anything else is in there, there was some form of contamination. Right? So the human body is the source of infection. Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes observed that mothers of home births had fewer infections than those who gave birth in hospitals. 
All right, so that was his observation. And he thought, well, why in the world would um, mothers who gave birth at home have fewer infections than those in the hospital? And he thought, well, they must be getting the infection from the hospital or a nosocomial infection. And then they realized that, well, they weren't really washing their hands real well at home. You know, home birth, we're assuming that the midwives or whatever, they wash their hands that day anyway. And if they're picking up, and even if they didn't wash their hands, the germs in that house, the mother would have already been exposed to. So even if they were delivering the baby, they weren't really reinfecting the mom with any of these um, germs that he hadn't been exposed to before. Um, and, you know, even if there were vaginal births and there was bleeding or whatever, and the tissue was compromised, there was fewer deaths, all right? So Semmelweis correlated infections with physicians coming directly from the autopsy room to the maternity ward, right, as I mentioned. And Joseph Lister, you guys have heard of Listerine, right, introduced aseptic techniques to reduce microbial microbes in medical settings with prevent wound infections. So they used to use silver, they used like scalding hot water and all kinds of chemicals to, um, to kill these organisms. You know, so I don't know. It was brutal when they first started. It was involved disinfection of hands using chemicals prior to surgery, use of heat for sterilization. And back then they couldn't really sterilize. They could sterilize everything but the endospores, but still way better than what they had before. All right, so the germ theory of disease. So that's just saying that all disease has to come from a germ. All right, and we'll talk about Cox, postulates, K-O-C-H postulates, and how we prove that. <clears throat> yeah, K-O-C-H. So many diseases are caused by the growth of microbes in the body and not by sins, bad character, poverty. So they used to think if you got sick, you were either a bad person, you committed sins, uh, it's because you were stupid or you were poor. Um, you know, those were all just ideas. Two major uh, con contributors were Pasteur or Pasteurization and Robert uh, Koch, who just proved that. Past year showed microbes cause fermentation and spoilage. That's why we pasteurize things. We just kind of, we don't sterilize it, but we get rid of the microbial load a little bit. All right. <clears throat> just prove spontaneous generation of microbes, all right, uh, with the gooseneck tubes, develop pasteurization, and demonstrate what is known as the germ theory of disease. So back in the day, you know, that was unheard of. Robert Koch established Cox postulate, a sequence of experiments, steps that verified the germ theory. Now he was able to identify the cause of anthrax, TB, and cholera. He would isolate it from an animal and then reinfect it, or infect a healthy animal with it, and then the animal would die. And they'd be able to re-pull that organism out of the out of the animal. So the animal was healthy, didn't have the organism, they'd reinfect with the but they infect, not reinfect, they infect the animal with the organism. The animal would die and they'd be able to re-pull the organism out of the animal. So he was able to more or less prove um, that whatever the organisms and what caused the disease. They were able to say, well, this organism caused this disease, this organism specifically called this disease. Develop pure culture methods. Now taxonomy. Organizing, classifying, and naming living things. Formal system, originated <clears throat> by Lynn, L-I-N-N-E. I've seen that question asked, but not very often. <clears throat> Concerned with classification, orderly arrangement of organisms into groups. So nomenclature, if you see that, that really just means name or assigning names to something. And they're gonna name it, um, you know, sometimes like an AMP by size, shape, color, like Staph aureus. Um, staff, you know, gives you linear, or I'm sorry, staff is um, clumps, aureus means gold or yellow, and these organisms we'll see in lab, right, when they colonize on the, the auger, they're gold in color. All right, and then when you gram stain them, they are in clusters. That's contingent on how they go through um, binary fission, how they reproduce. We'll give you the tetrad or the cluster or the um, strap linear shape. So identification, determining and recording traits of an organism by uh, placement and taxonomy schemes. And then they'll do a lot of that. And even this textbook, they'll give you the, one of the chapters will be on, you know, this, whatever doesn't fit everything else, you know, we have to cover it. 
So levels of classification, um, I'm sure you probably learned this um, earlier on, I hope. Domain, so archaea, bacteria, or eukaryotes, we're gonna mention archaea. These are organisms that live in extreme environments, um, super cold, super salty, heliophytes, mesophytes, um, thermophytes, things that like heat, cold, um, salty in environments, um, barophytes like a lot of pressure. Um, so they're very specific, but we're not gonna worry about them in this course because they're not gonna find your body hospitable. It's gonna be too cold, too warm, not salty enough. Um, the pressure won't be right. So we're not gonna worry about archaea. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. So all we care about in this course is genus and species. Genus is always first, like if we're talking about E. coli, all right? Asheratia is a genus, E. coli is a species, and then each species has, you know, E. coli is H15707, depending on whether it has a flagella or an antigen or whatever, all right? Okay, <clears throat> so it's binomial, all right, nomenclature. Two names, genus is always capitalized, species is lowercase. And I will probably screw that up in your notes, but it's supposed to be capital C dot coli, lowercase. Or both are italicized in another one, like Staphylococcus aureus, or S, if I, you see S aureus, you know that's Staph aureus, just an abbreviation. All right. Like phylum, all right between groups of organisms. So phylum is usually like, how does it look, all right? Evolution, all new species originate from pre-existing uh, species. Closely related organisms have similar features because they evolve from common ancestral forms. And we can always go in and genetically test it. Like Shigella and E. coli, different organisms, all right? But genetically, they're similar. So we know they probably came from uh, each other and that could be, um, through pili doing uh, variance factors, trading back and forth. All right. Evolution usually always progresses towards greater complexity. You know, things, always, things are never gonna be less organized or less advanced. They're always gonna to advance towards greater complexity. You know, there's a theory now that, you know, this, um, you know, whatever virus we have now, whatever you wanna call it, whatever variation, all right, it's going to, it, it, you know, there's um, Zach Bush and some of the people way smarter than me um, are talking about how these viruses are actually able to upregulate our DNA. All right. I know it sounds crazy and um, insane, but they're saying a lot of these viruses, they mutate and they're able to, um, they can go in and they can alter our DNA, all right, it's for good or bad, right? So it could be, um, you know, the junk DNA packets or um, activating some of this uh, latent DNA, you know, not to get crazy. Um, <clears throat> so there's just bacteria, true bacteria, archaea, like I said, these are odd, odd bacteria that live in extreme environments, high salt, heat, cold, a lot of pressure. We're not gonna really care about them. I mean, I'm saying that they're, they're not important in the environment because they are. But for this course, no, they're not gonna be um, medically relevant. You're not gonna see them, all right? And then eukaryotes or eukarya have nucleus and organelles, right? And I think that should be it. So I'm going to stop this. I'm going to upload it into Zoom, It'll take a little while and then I'll pop it into the course.